Yes. Start on. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, um, everybody in the audience and the people watching at home via live stream. It's such a pleasure to see so many people gathering here today uh, to talk about feminism and sexual freedom. My name is Marci Latefeer. I'm a journalist and a writer with many years of interest in this topic. And I'm very happy and honored to be your host today of this Dolomina lecture. Um, this is an initiative of the city of Amsterdam and Atria. Uh, it's organized by Atria, uh, the Institute for Emancipation and Women's History. So this is the second time this lecture is held. Uh, the first time was in 2020, starring uh, Mandel Reed from the British Women's Equality Party as guest speaker about female leadership. So the Dolomina Lecture owes its name, of course, to the feminist group and movement that campaigned for equal rights uh, for men and women in the 70s and 80s. I believe we even have members of this group in the audience, so a very warm welcome to them. <laughs> So the goals they fought for, such as self-determination, uh, the right to choose what happens to your body, and how you live your life, are unfortunately still socially relevant today. We're more than 50 years later, and still the sexual, re sexual revolution is far from complete. The Me Too movement has made abundantly clear that sexually transgressive behavior is a social problem that affects almost every woman. And we even see sexual violence sti is still deliberately used as means to silence women and assert power. So how do women worldwide, worldwide stand up for their sexual freedom? How do they fight for their right to sexual pleasure? And what role does sexuality play in feminism? These are the questions we are going to talk about today with a really uh, nice uh, guests and uh, some panelists, some speakers. But before I introduce them to you, uh, Atria and the city of Amsterdam first want to welcome you too. So I uh, would like to start with uh, Dr. Paula Thijs, who is senior researcher at Atria. There she is. Uh, Paula, if you want to take the stage. I'll do it like this. Okay, um, well, it's so wonderful to see so many of you here and uh, online. Um, we as Atria are very grateful to organize this Dolomina lecture, and we are very happy that Mona El Tahavi has come all the way from Canada to speak to us. <laughs> 60 years ago, a tiny pill made a big change. In 1962, the birth control pill was introduced, uh, which caused the sexual revolution it was a time of sexual liberation, a time of free love. A tiny pill had a huge impact, but that was made possible by the work of second wave feminists. In the Netherlands, Dolomina fought against sexual violence and campaigned for uh, access to abortion, free childcare and free birth control. Their protest actions were often playful and humorous and attracted a lot of attention. 50 years later, many of these issues that Dolomina fought for are still relevant. Dolomina inspires us to keep fighting for sexual liberation and for a right of self-determination. Until all of us are free to make our own choices about our body and our sexuality. As Atria, we wish you a lot of inspiration and fun. Thank you, Paula. I will now hand over to Rutger Groot Wassink, who is the City Councillor for Social Affairs, Democratization and Real Estate within the City of Amsterdam. But previously, he was a City Councillor for Diversity, and as such, he has uh, initiated this lecture. So please give a warm welcome to Rutger. Thank you very much, and I didn't quite expect to do this in English, but I'll try to give it my best. And let me first say that I'm very honored and happy to be here uh, and to, um, to welcome you on behalf of the city of Amsterdam. I shouldn't be here um, because uh, uh, as Deputy Mayor Toria Meliani is now responsible for this Dolomina Lezing, 
it would have been more fitted that she would do the opening, but on, uh, due to personal circumstances, she could not make it. So that's why I'm here. And I have to say that I'm very um, happy uh, to have a small chance to talk to you and to introduce our guest. Um, uh, it's, as already said, uh, Mona El Tahawi uh, is, I think, a very inspirational, very um, inspiring person uh, for not only us in the Netherlands, but for the whole world. And I'm looking forward to what she's going to say, because uh, there was a quote of her, I'm delighted that I've upset you so much. And I truly hope that she's going to upset us. But I know her as an writer, an activist, and above all, a feminist, uh, who has a strong, strong urge uh, to work for sexual freedom for women, to work uh, on issues on, uh, uh, um, uh, on sexuality and human rights and women's rights in uh, also the, the Arabic uh, world and, and such. And she's saying that we need a revolution uh, to, change, uh, uh, um, to change our thinking about women and women's sexual rights. Um, to quote, the battle over women's bodies can only be won by a revolution of the mind. And I'm strongly convinced that also in the Netherlands, and sometimes we even hear people say that uh, emancipation is done. We still need this revolution of the mind. We still need this revolution of the public space. We still need a revolution of the way that men and women behave towards each other. Um, I think that we all know the examples. I think that we all know that there's a lot of work still to be done by women and by men. And I hope that our speaker uh, can give us more inspiration to that. So um, it's with a lot of honor and pleasure that I can uh, call this out. Please give a warm welcome to Mona El Tahawi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mona El Tahawi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I begin today, as I always begin, with my declaration of faith fuck the patriarchy. Having said that, I want to thank Atria and the city of Amsterdam for inviting me to give this Dolly Mina lecture. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. And I also want to thank and acknowledge the work of black and women of color and activists of color in the Netherlands whose work has made my presence here today possible. I acknowledge you and I send you love and solidarity. It's important that a woman like me is here, and I'm here because of the work of those activists that I want to acknowledge. I want in my talk as well to acknowledge activists around the world because I think this is a really important moment in global history. We are not out of this pandemic. The pandemic is not finished. The pandemic goes on because patriarchy goes on. And I am here as an avowed enemy to patriarchy. I am here to talk about ways to destroy patriarchy because there is no revolution without destroying patriarchy. And in order to give you my ideas about how we should destroy patriarchy, I want to talk about what patriarchy is. Because I think people often think that patriarchy is this one thing, a man or a group of people or something. They, they want to know who is it? Is it that fascist fuck Donald Trump? Is it Geert Wilders? I can't pronounce his name, but fuck him. Who is it, you know? <laughs> who is the patriarchy? And so let's begin with my definition of the patriarchy. I want you to imagine an octopus. Now, I know that an octopus is a beautiful creature. They're very intelligent. Each one of their tentacles has its own brain. They're very devious. They're beautiful, yes. But I want you to imagine that the patriarchy is an octopus. And I want you to imagine the head of the octopus is patriarchy. And each one of the eight tentacles of the patriarchy is a form of oppression. Because the definition of feminism for me, is the destruction of patriarchy. And the definition of, pa the definition of patriarchy is a system of institutions and oppressions that privilege male dominance. Now, when I say male dominance, you will see in my talk as we go on, I don't mean all men, and I also don't excuse all women from it. 
because there are some women who benefit from patriarchy and there are many men who are deeply hurt by patriarchy. So imagine that octopus. And imagine each one of those tentacles, as I said, is a form of oppression. So what would that look like? Depending on where you live in the world, one tentacle would be white supremacy. Definitely here, definitely in the United States, in so many other parts of the world. Another tentacle is misogyny. Too often, feminism, especially the feminism that we call white feminism, focuses just on misogyny. Being the person that I am, I cannot afford to focus just on misogyny. So misogyny is just one of those eight tentacles. Another tentacle is capitalism, because I have privilege, I acknowledge that many of us in the audience, simply by mere virtue of being here today, have privilege that capitalism denies so many others. So one of the tentacles is capitalism, another is homophobia, another is transphobia, another is ableism, another is ageism. This is probably more than eight tentacles now. But this is just to give you an idea of how all-encompassing patriarchy is. I like to remind people it's like asking a fish, what is water? If you ask a fish what is water, it won't know what you're talking about because water is every, it's, it's life. And that is patriarchy to us. And that became tragically apparent during a pandemic that has been a fucking disaster, a disaster for women and girls around the world, but not just women and girls around the world, for black people, for people of color, for indigenous people, for disabled people, for the working class, for the under-resourced, for the disabled, for so many people who were suffocated by the tentacles of the patriarchy. So if I want one thing today from my talk, I want you to imagine who is the person who would be most suffocated by those eight tentacles of the patriarchy? And when we liberate, that person who is the most suffocated from the tentacles of the patriarchy, we have won. The revolution has succeeded. Now that might seem an impossible task, and it is fucking exhausting to fight all of those eight tentacles, but that is the revolution. That is the feminist revolution that we need, because it's not enough to talk just about misogyny. It's not enough to talk just about equality. I don't want to be equal to a man who is not free. Why would I want that? I want to be free. And so I'm here to remind, I can't see because of the lights, whatever man is in the audience and whatever men are watching, that you are not totally free. None of us is until that person suffocated by the octopus called patriarchy is free. So how do we free ourselves from the patriarchy? In addition to my declaration of faith, fuck the patriarchy, my revolutionary declaration is the revolution is my cunt. I use that word deliberately and intentionally. I use that word because it disturbs people, and as you heard in the introduction, I'm delighted to disturb and upset people. I make that my mission in life. I use that word intentionally because it's profane and I'm profane, because this is not the time for politeness. We are living in a world that in so many countries is on the threshold of theocracy and fascism, including my country of naturalization, the United States, which influences the entire world, including your country. So this is not the time for politeness. Politeness, when we are on the threshold of fascism and theocracy, is capitulation. And I refuse to capitulate, so fuck that shit. The revolution is my cunt. What do I mean by the revolution is my cunt? I don't mean a cunt as in a vulva or a vagina that belongs in a cisgender, heterosexual woman's body. It is much more complex than that. For me, the cunt is the site of revolution. Because not all women have vulvas or vaginas, and some women don't have vulvas or vaginas, because I insist on including trans women in my feminist revolution. And there are non-binary and other gender-expansive people who also have vaginas and vulvas, and we don't recognize that. But I say the revolution is my cunt to make very clear that there is no liberation without sexual liberation. There is no liberation without gender liberation. And there is no liberation without queer liberation. We are in the month of pride in many countries across the world. And in case anyone thinks that we don't need pride anymore or feels complacent about how everyone is free, love is love and all that rubbish and bullshit, it's much more than love is love. This is about who you can fuck. Because desire and who you can fuck is political. It's not about love. Is, of course love is, is, is important. But this, especially when I'm saying the revolution is my cunt, this is about who you can fuck and who you're allowed to say no to. Because in the United States, 
the most powerful country in the world that is on the verge of a theocracy and fascism and which influences the entire world, men were arrested who, who went all the way from Texas to another state to deliberately disrupt and violently attack a pride parade in Idaho. This is in the United States, supposedly you know, the freest country in the world, which also obviously is absolute shit. It's not the freest country in the world. So I'm here to give you a warning from your future. Because in the United States, too many people, specifically white people, are too complacent about rights. And when I say the revolution is my cunt, I'm here to remind you that you cannot afford complacency. Because here, also in the Netherlands, you are facing a grave danger. After this pandemic, we are facing two camps, and you have to choose which camp you belong to. There is the camp of patriarchy, that is Poland, which is one of your neighbors, it's not too far, which is Geert Wilders and the right-wing parties here in the, in the Netherlands, which is Brexit in the UK, which is the right-wing and the Republicans and the theocrats and the fascists in the US, which is Bolsonaro, which is Modi, which is so many dictators and fascists and theocrats around the world, and also those who are their foot soldiers, foot soldiers of the patriarchy. Too many women are foot soldiers of the patriarchy. And then there's the rest of us. And the rest of us are those who go around and say the revolution is my cunt because we are deliberate in defying, disobeying and disrupting patriarchy. How do we do that? I take with me when I travel examples from around the world. I was born in Egypt and many of you will remember that we had a revolution in Egypt and many countries in the region around Egypt that began with Tunisia in 2010 and spread across the region that is now called Southwest Asia. You most still being referred to as the Middle East, but we're rejecting that more and more as a colonial construct. So in 2011, Egyptians rose up against the oppression of the state. Now, 11 years later, feminists and queer people are rising up in what I am, is, I am convinced is a sexual revolution that says the revolution is my cunt, because we have realized over the past decade and plus now that it is not enough to rise up against the state. The state is not the only entity that oppresses me. It is the state and the street and the home, what I call the trifecta of patriarchy. And these feminists and queer people in Egypt are rising up in the same spirit that people rose up 11 years ago to say enough and to say I count. But instead of being on the street, on the barricades on the street, throwing Molotov cocktails at the riot police and, and the violence of the state, they are staging a, a revolution that I believe is much more powerful because it's a revolution that is taking place from the privacy of home. And home is where the hardest revolution has to be undertaken. Because the dictator in the state, Mubarak in the case of Egypt, and the dictator on the street corner, imagine a Mubarak on the street corner who owns public space, who sexually harasses us, who makes it dangerous, and who says public space belongs to a man, and the Mubarak at home, all of these dictators go home. So the hardest revolution is the revolution at home. And these feminists and queer people in Egypt undertaking the revolution is my cunt are doing so <coughs> of the, uh, using the barricades of social media so that everyone can access their revolution at home. And that is the most potent revolution because they are challenging every taboo you can imagine. And the, the reason we need a sexual revolution is because when there is silence and shame and taboo, the most marginalized and the most vulnerable are hurt the most. And they, they are women, girls, and queer people. So you see those sexual revolutionaries in Egypt talking about orgasms and sex and abortion and masturbation and anal sex and consent, all of these things that 10 years ago would have been unimaginable. And they're doing it in Arabic, some are doing it in English. We have a trans activist, a, a male trans activist, so a trans man who's an activist. We have a trans woman who's an activist. We have people who are interviewing each other in Arabic using podcasts. All of this is part of a revolution that I believe is much more powerful than the revolution that began 11 years ago. Because when men say, because many men are saying to us, this is not the time. What they mean is, we don't yet, as men, have the power we want from the state. And they say, the state oppresses everyone, which is true. But the state and the street and the home together oppress women, girls, and queer people. So it's not enough to rise up against the state. And that, 
that pattern, that trifecta of patriarchy is not just limited to Egypt. You can also apply it here in the Netherlands because you also have a revolution that has to go home because in this country, domestic violence and intimate partner violence has not been eradicated. The Me Too, Me Too movement in your country has exposed predators in very powerful positions such as Ajax Football Club and others in your country who have also been predators with impunity. In the United States, most definitely, we need that trifecta of patriarchy to be dismantled, not only because we stand on the verge of losing the right to an abortion, but because simple, when, when I talk about bodily autonomy, I'm not just talking about the right to abortion, I'm talking about the right to say I own my body without my body being violated through sexual violence. And in the United States, out of every 1,000 rapes, only five ends up in prison because the system is stacked against us, because the system is the trifecta of patriarchy. So it's not enough to say, wait for the law to take care of things. It's not enough to say we have democracy and democracy is the way to go, because in the United States, supposedly a democracy, white Christian theocrats have used democracy to cut democracy at its knees. By, for over the past 50 years, staging what I call is a social regression, not a social revolution, to destroy the right to abortion, and this is a right that the majority of Americans support. So what does it mean when fascists and theocrats are about to destroy the right that most people in a country support? That is not a democracy. Now, this kind of conversation where we talk about fascists and theocrats is usually a conversation that is had about the country where I was born, and the country where I was raised, Saudi Arabia. But that's because too many white people are complacent, and I'm very deliberate in talking about, about white people, because that is what's happening in the United States. The danger of this complacency is that the arrogance and naivete that is the foundation of this complacency had too many white Americans saying, Trump will never be elected because they believe that dictators only happen over there. They believe that dictators only live in countries where black and brown people live, because they somehow believe that black and brown people deserve the dictator that we have. And they will also tell you, we will never lose Roe v. Wade, and we are standing on the verge of losing Roe v. Wade. Why? Because, again, they kept saying it will never happen here, because the, the, the idea of women losing rights, again, only happens in countries where black and brown people are. In Afghanistan, with the Taliban. In Iran, where the revolution was stolen by the theocrats. In so many other countries. But to make white people confront their own trifecta of patriarchy, to make white people recognize that saying the revolution is my cunt is as much an urgency for them as it, as it is for countries where black and brown people live, this is where their arrogance and naivete says, no, 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 it will never happen here, and it's about to happen there. And that danger will come here, which is why I'm telling you I come, from a, I come with a warning from your future, because it is not enough to say, we have a democracy, we have feminism, we have women in parliament, we have this, we have that. It is not enough. You also have a right-wing party and you also have a, an abortion debate that is determined to roll back rights. And the importance of not being complacency is to recognize that rights are not enough. You must have rights with justice. Because as I said, misogyny is not enough. I cannot afford to just fight misogyny, or fighting misogyny is not just enough. I have to fight the whole octopus called patriarchy, and it's not enough to just want to be equal to a man because men are not free from the ravages of that octopus, from white supremacy, from capitalism, ableism, etc. It is not enough to just say reproductive rights, because reproductive rights means a feminism that I reject, which is a feminism that focuses on the individual. It's a feminism that says me and my friends are free, which means everybody is free, which means feminism has succeeded, we are post-feminist. That is bullshit. That is not my feminism. My feminism is not interested in celebrating a few exceptional women who have managed through privilege that protects them from that octopus called patriarchy to be on the other side of it and say, see, feminism has succeeded. I have jumped over the obstacles that, that, that patriarchy put in my way. I am more interested in destroying the obstacles that hold everyone else back. I'm not going to be on that side of the, the ob obstacles with rich, privileged, white, cisgender, heterosexual women. That is not my revolution. 
My revolution is to destroy the obstacles by saying the revolution is my cunt, by defying, disobeying the patriarchy, by reminding people of this. I came here, I said I came with a warning from your future, but I also come with a celebration of my past. And I want to share this with you because, as I said, the United States likes to think of itself as you know, the freest country in the world, and this oppression only happens over there. But it also likes to think of itself as all countries do. We march onwards towards progress, as if progress is this linear march. It is not the case. And as a, as a sad reminder, but also as a celebration, I want to share with you some poetry that is from my heritage. I was born to an Egyptian family of Muslim descent, and I, I love poetry. And part of the revolution is my cunt, is to remind people that when I talk about sex, it is not to imitate white people, it is not to imitate the so-called West, it is instead to tap back into a heritage that is mine, that has been, not, has been denied to me by conservatives. In my culture, in my religion of birth, and in the region where I come from, because those conservatives are the same conservatives which in the United States today are destroying abortion rights. Those conservatives who are destroying the spirit of what I'm about to read you are the same conservatives in your country who are also obsessed with white babies and white demographics and with wanting to talk about the abortion debate so that they can deny you too bodily autonomy. Those conservatives exist everywhere and throughout the ages and they are there to destroy this linear, this idea that progress is somehow linear unless we pay attention. So I want to read to you part of a poem by a woman who lived in the 11th century. This is an Arab Muslim woman writing in the 11th century. And she says, her name is Atimad Ar-Rumaykiyya. I urge you to come faster than the wind, to mount my breast and firmly dig and plow my body. And don't let go until you flushed me thrice. She was writing this basically to her man saying, come now and fuck me three times. <laughs> this is a woman who openly celebrated her desire. This is a woman who owned her pleasure. This is a woman who said the revolution is my cunt. And it is especially important to me as someone who has survived sexual violence everywhere I have lived. But I've survived sexual violence during the revolution in Egypt. I was not the only person, specifically woman, that the Egyptian regime targeted, and I have not just been targeted by the Egyptian regime, but some of you might know that in 2011, the Egyptian regime's riot police broke both my arms and sexually assaulted me. And I've been sexually assaulted and I've spoken very openly about a sexual assault that I experienced twice during the Muslim pilgrimage in 1982 when I was 15 years old. And I connect that sexual assault during the pilgrimage in Islam's holiest site when I was 15 years old to a sexual assault when I was 50, five zero years old, in a club in Montreal, Canada. I connect to all of those because it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of a revolution. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the pilgrimage, which is the fifth pillar of your religion, at the holiest site of your religion, and it doesn't matter if you're in a club, and you're 50 years old and you think, this shit is done now, this isn't going to happen to me anymore. When I was in pilgrimage, I was wearing hijab, everything was covered except my face and my hands. When I was in the club in Montreal, I was wearing a tank, tap, a tank top and jeans. It doesn't matter what you wear, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter where you are, because Patriarchy lives everywhere because patriarchy is like the water to fish. And so I say this and I celebrate the spirit of what Ertimad Moikea was saying in order to say I own my body as a, 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 a prelude and as an accompaniment to the revolution is my cunt. Because when I say I own my body, what I'm saying is my body belongs to me, not to the state, not the street, not the home. And just as importantly, my body belongs to me, not to the mosque or the church or the temple. And when I say my body belongs to me, it means that I decide who I fuck when I want to fuck them with their consent, obviously, in the spirit of, this, of these verses that I read to you. When I say I own my body, it also means that I celebrate all the ways that I have evolved personally and politically. Because when the Egyptian riot police broke my arms and sexually assaulted me in November of 2011, I promised myself as a way of reclaiming my body 
that I would give myself a gift for surviving. And at the time, the most appropriate gift was to dye my hair bright red, to say, fuck you, I'm not hiding, I survived, you did not kill me. And to get tattoos on both my arms as a way of reclaiming the body that they broke. To say that when my bones heal, I will create permanent marks on my body, like the scar that you caused in my body because I needed an operation. I'm proud of that scar, but I did not consent to the scar, but I have these markings on my body as a way to say, I'm reclaiming my body. But just as importantly, I reclaim my body through pleasure and desire and joy. Because the conversation about sexual violence, when we talk about bodily autonomy, and this is understandable, often begins and ends with, there is no shame in being a survivor of sexual violence. Of course there isn't. The shame belongs to the predators. This is why Me Too is important. This is why in sharing our stories, it's important. But for me, the revolution is my cunts. That spirit, the spirit of the verses I just read you, it's not enough. Just as it's not enough to just fight misogyny or to say I want equality with men who are not free, it's not enough to just say, I, I am not ashamed, I survived sexual violence. That is powerful. But it's also powerful to complete that sentence by saying, yes, I survived sexual violence, I own my body, and I am now reclaiming the power of my sexuality, the power of my desire, and the power of the joy from my pleasure and desire. And so I talk about sex. I'm often accused of being obsessed with sex. I am proud to be obsessed with sex. Because when you talk about sex, you're talking about that revolution that is at home that is the most powerful revolution. You are saying the state and the street and the home together are the, 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 the dictators, the trifecta that I must overthrow. You are saying that there is a chaos and liberation that the state, the street, and the home recognize that makes them react so viscerally when you say, I own my body. When I say, I fuck who I want when I want, there is this visceral reaction from the patriarchy because it, it creates a chaos and liberation it cannot control. And that is even more so when I say, I fuck who I want when I want with their consent, obviously, but outside of the boundaries and norms, outside of the heteronormative and the mononormative norms, now, it took me a really long time to get here because the ways I was socialized, socialized me to, be, to, to think of sex in a particular way. But since I was attacked 10 years ago, part of reclaiming my body and reclaiming my, my sexuality is also liberating myself from the ways I was socializing. So on Thursday, I am among the contributors to an anthology called This Arab is Queer. Because one of the things that I have done over the past decade is to liberate myself from heteronormativity and to say openly and proudly, I am queer. I am also liberating myself from mononormativity, and that is the ways that we are socialized to be monogamous. I am a feminist who is determined to be free. Liberation for me is not through monogamy. Monogamy is used by patriarchy, specifically capitalist patriarchy, to create patterns and families, and, and nuclear families specifically, that fulfill the needs of capitalist patriarchy. I am not a walking incubator for capitalist patriarchy. And I am not a foot soldier for mononormative patriarchy. I insist on being free. And part of that insistence is to say I am queer, to say I am polyamorous, and to say I am not monogamous, proudly and with no shame. Because when we, when, we, when we see shame and silence and taboo, those are the places and the spaces where the most marginalized are hurt. And part also of liberating myself and shedding this shame is to also say to you that I am 54 years old and I am going through perimenopause, which is a, a change that so many cisgender women, but also non-binary and gender expansive people go through, but it is one of those taboos that are also surrounded by silence and shame. And the older I get, the more shameless I become. Because instead of my... <laughs> Thank you. Because I like to say, instead of my period, which is thankfully, like, it's been about 10 months now, and I'm hoping it's going to be 12 months soon so I can finally be free. Instead of my period that used to come every month and I would shed the lining of my uterus, I am every month instead shedding the patriarchal fuckery that I was socialized in. <laughs> because this is all part of my, the revolution is my cunt. I don't know how many more minutes I've got to go, but I'm sure I've got to wrap up soon. But before I wrap up, I want to remind you 
of other revolutionaries around the world who are also saying the revolution is my cunt because I want you to take them home with you because they are important in these times of theocracy and fascism. When I said to you, we are between two camps now and you must choose which camp you belong to. Because if I have delineated the theocrats and the fascists, I want you to see who the revolutionaries are. I've already spoken about the revolutionaries in Egypt, the feminists and queer activists who are throwing Molotov cocktails at the barricades in our minds, at the Mubaraks in our minds. During the revolution in 2011, the Molotov cocktail was a weapon. Now, a very potent weapon is the sex toy. And there is a group of activists in the region where I come from who've created the first sex toy by Arab women for Arab women. Now, this isn't to say that Arab women need a specific kind of sex toy that doesn't already <laughs> They exist because, you know, just use a fucking dildo or sex toy or whatever. They all work. But this is to say that Arab women are claiming the power of creating a sex toy by Arab women for Arab women. And if the revolution, you followed the revolution in Tahrir Square and other squares, one tweet at a time, this is a revolution that takes liberation home one orgasm at a time. So who else is a revolutionary on the barricades of our minds saying, I own my body? I want you to remember Mexican feminists who succeeded in decriminalizing abortion, not by being polite and saying please, but by saying fuck you to the patriarchy, but just as importantly by being anarchists. By saying, fuck legal, we recognize that the law in this country is important, but we will have abortion whether it's legal or not. But the importance of the fight for decriminalizing abortion is less about legal and illegal. Fuck the state and its opinion about what I can and can't do with my uterus. That control belongs to me. It is instead about recognizing the power of owning our abortions. And that's another thing I've been doing as I liberate myself from shame and silence. I've been talking about my own illegal abortion in Egypt in 1996 and legal abortion in the United States in 2000, in the United States where in many places it will become illegal. <coughs> so Mexican feminists who on Safe Abortion Day in 2020 were attacking the police with hammers and Molotov cocktail because fuck the police, because they are agents of a capitalist violent state and that the state uses the police against us. So remember Mexican anarchist feminists who deliberately exercise civil disobedience and they go out and they vandalize places because they say, fuck the art, all these paintings and artworks of Mexican male revolutionaries. Mexican women who are dying every day by femicide are more important. I want you to remember the revolutionaries in Ireland, a Catholic country where these revolutionaries, feminists and queer activists, stage a revolution against the Catholic church and its stranglehold over education, our bodies, I, uh, the revolution is my cunt, they said, because in 2015, those activists successfully got marriage equality to be passed by a referendum, and in 2018, successfully reversed the Eighth Amendment in their constitution that, made, that put, put a ban on abortion. And I want you to remember that even though their fight has not succeeded, there are queer and feminist activists in Poland who say fuck you to the state, who invade churches during services and say fuck you to priests who are part of the theocracy and the fascism in Poland. And they're not too far away from you here. And I hope that their fight against the criminalization of abortion succeeds. And then I want you to remember activists and revolutionaries who I will conclude my talk to. Because in the same way that I begin all my talks with fuck the patriarchy, I end my talks with the inspiration from these activists in Argentina. And again, they are activists who are feminist and queer activists together. Because increasingly, around the world, we are seeing alliances that are especially important between feminist and queer activists. Because as I said, there is no liberation without sexual, gender, and queer liberation. And if your feminism does not include trans feminism, then I am not on your side. You are not a feminist that is in interested in true liberation because our fight is against patriarchy. I'm not here to uphold the power and privilege of cisgender, heterosexual, specifically white women. I'm here to destroy and dismantle all those powers and privileges. So I've already told, told you about Mexican feminists, also feminists and, and I mean activists in Mexico, feminists and queer in Poland, in Ireland and in Argentina in 2019 when the vote against the decriminalization of abortion narrowly failed an activist group called Ni Una Menos, which has become incredibly powerful across the Americas. Their symbol is the green handkerchief and the green scarf. The, their name means not one more. 
and they began as a movement against femicide, against gender-based violence across the continent, Central and South America, and they're becoming especially influential now in the United States, and that is good, because the United States too often thinks it's the center of the universe when it, instead it should be learning from the rest of the universe. And so now Mexican feminists are sharing their strategies with American feminists. So in Argentina, when that vote against um, legalizing abortion narrowly failed, Ni Una Menos was part of massive street protests and they issued a statement that is incredibly powerful. Every time I read it, it gives me goosebumps. And in the statement they said, we, women, men, and trans people, are out on the street today because regardless of what happens in the Senate, we have brought our bodies on the street, we have brought our desires on the street, and we will not hide anymore. Because they recognized and they, they, they directly tied the bodily autonomy that we demand in order to be able to choose whether we have a pregnant, complete a pregnancy or not. And what that is, is reproductive justice, not just reproductive rights. Reproductive justice is a term that black feminists of African descent coined in, I think it was 1994, to say that reproductive rights is the privilege of white women. The rest of us need reproductive justice because reproductive justice would dismantle the octopus that is the patriarchy. So remember, rights and justice, rights are not enough. Rights only benefit the few privileged ones. So these Argentinian feminists, men, women, and trans activists were on the street basically saying, we will not go home because our demand for reproductive justice is here, we have come out of hiding, and they also directly connected abortion with this right to say, I fuck who I want when I want, because they talked about desire. Because whether the fascists are in Ireland or Poland or the United States or here or in Saudi Arabia or Egypt, they all have the same thing in common, and that is to control our desire and to control our bodies. So they, those activists in Argentina were directly confronting that. And they said, no matter what happens, we will not leave the street. Abortion is a reality, and we will not leave the street, and we will not stop reminding you of that. And they succeeded, because at the end of 2020, Argentina, and I think 2021, Argentina finally decriminalized abortion. And they ended their statement with a way that I like to end my talks, because it represents to me the heart of the revolution is my cunt. It represents to me the need to destroy the octopus that is the patriarchy. For me, it is the ethos of destroying the trifecta of state, street, and home. And it, it is a reminder that we are the ones we have been waiting for. I have these words tattooed on my arm by the bisexual black poet and feminist activist June Jordan. We are the ones we have been waiting for because no one is coming to save us. So what is that statement that they said in Argentina? That statement is, we will not be burnt because this time the fire is ours. So I want you to take that statement with you at, when you go home tonight. And I want you to figure out for yourselves how you will own the fire. What does the fire look like for you? Own that fire. Keep that fire burning in your belly. Think of it as a pilot light against injustice and use that fire to look patriarchy in the eye and say, I will fucking destroy you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I love them. So, thank you so much, Mona, for this great inspirational talk. And uh, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, so I only have one question to ask yes. uh, before I, I can ask our panelists. And I'm struggling which question it is. <laughs> but from all the questions, um, the main the thing is, I think, how do you liberate from this trifecta? Because as, as I see it, this trifecta is not only the state and the street in our home, but also our mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you told that you were, uh, 10 years ago, you were different than now, mm -hmm. and you were not so sexually liberated. Mm -hmm. So how does one liberate oneself? How do you own this fire? How do you find it and 
keep it burning mm -hmm. uh, while this patriarchy is, is fucking our mind. Yes. Um, thank you. And I, I, I understood I was speaking for more than 20 it's minutes, no, but when no I speak, I can speak for 20 hours. So. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> thank you. Um, look, I often tell people that the ways that you can begin to use that fire against the state street and the home and all the other forms of oppressions, the octopus and all of that, is what I call feminism in 3D. And the three Ds are, I mentioned them during my talk, defy, disobey, and disrupt. So find ways every day to defy, disobey, and disrupt the patriarchy. They can be very simple things, as in disrupting a sexist joke or a homophobic or a transphobic comment. But every day when you do that, I, I like to remind people that it's like lifting weights. Exercise your feminist muscles. At first, you have to use very light weights because your muscles haven't been working out. And then you need to move to... More to heavier weights, because if you keep sticking to the, to the light weights, you'll, you'll make no progress. Mm -hmm. So for me, the ways that I've done it for myself, I mean, 10 years ago, I wasn't as sexually liberated as I am in the way that, in, in, in that I wasn't saying openly, I am queer. I was sexually liberated in other ways. I mean, I've been saying for years now, I fuck the guilt out of my system, <laughs> the guilt that I was raised with about having sex. But, you know, I wasn't talking about my abortions and I wasn't talking about being queer. So the way that I have exercised my muscles is to remind myself that I too need to challenge myself because the, the, the heart of my writing, I like to think, is being brave. And I always ask myself, am I brave? Mm -hmm. And every time I think I've done something that is the bravest thing I've ever done, I say, okay, what is next? Because that would be the, rep like the, the, the for example, the lifting weights that are two kilos or whatever. Okay, I've done that now. What is the next level that makes me even braver? So I talked about my abortions. Okay, what's next? I talk about being queer. Okay, what's next? And all of that, at the heart of being brave is taking risks. So for me as a writer, everyone has to figure out what the three Ds are for them. For me as a writer, it is to take that risk that is scary and terrifying and put it in my work and ask, how can I be brave and what risk, how can I be braver? And what is the risk I need to take now to make my writing more relevant and make it braver? Nice, thank you. Uh, one question, one more question though. How, uh, how can we uh, know what is the risk that we need to take right now? Because in the 70s, we also needed a sexual revolution, and feminism is, is you know, struggling for, for decades, for, for centuries, mm. uh, and still we are talking about patriarchy, and it's still, uh, yeah, alive and kicking. Mm. So, what is the risk that we haven't taken before and what is the risk we need to take as feminists? Well, I think the risk is to move beyond the comfort of um, feminism is equality and that's it. Mm. Now, it, uh, this w there was a time when that statement alone was revolutionary, but feminism is much more than equality because as I kept saying, I don't want to be equal to a man who himself is not free. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, what is the challenge? So we need to figure out the ways that we can best challenge patriarchy. And it, it is to say, Patriarchy is all of those eight tentacles. How are the ways that we cut off all of those eight tentacles? And it's especially relevant now after this pandemic when we've seen who suffers the most. It, like I said, it's black, brown, indigenous people, disabled people, working class people, women and girls and queer people around the world. So I think now, especially those who feel comfortable and feel that the revolution has finished and we don't need this anymore, they are the last people to speak. So now what I, what I want, and I think what we've been missing for too long, is to, to recognize who presents the biggest challenge to patriarchy right now. And I want feminism now to be led by the not rich, the not white, and the not famous. So I want a feminism that is led by queer people of color. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Many more questions to come after our panel discussion. So I would like to invite you to take a seat in the yes. audience and I would like to invite our speakers, uh, Milu Dele, Mungayende and uh, Saida Derazi on the stage for our panel discussion. No? Yeah, yes. please, yeah. <laughs> please come. So we have... Um, <laughs> please take a seat. It's so wonderful to have you here. Uh, we have Milu Dele, uh, for the ones who don't know her, she's a journalist, a writer and an activist and her clip, uh, her clip on slut shaming went viral yeah. uh, in 2017, <laughs> already years ago, yeah. and uh, she has been speaking out for sexual liberation ever since. Her new book is called Who Doen We Het, it's right here, it's about yeah, how do we have sex as women. And um, yeah, it's a wonderful book. And in it, she explores the current state of sexuality in the Netherlands. Milu, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. 
Mungayende, do I call you Mungayende or Mungayende mm -hmm. Helen Christen? Mungayende. Mungayende. So okay. Mungayende is an essayist, publicist and performance artist yeah. and she created the cross-medial feminist audio collective Fufu and Dados. Um, I love that name. And she writes essays on being black, uh, becoming female and sexualization. She's also the... Um, the writer of, uh, or the, uh, no, sorry, um, the comp composer uh, of this essay collection called Liberté, Égalité, Beyoncé, about um, Beyoncé's influence on feminism and black empowerment. Munga Yen, so nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Saida Derazi is a human rights activist, yes. and um, she uh, is co founder of Speak which is a collective of Muslim women who fight for self-determination and speak out against racism and Islamophobia. Uh, with the slogan, my body is not your battleground, speak campaigns against the politicization of Muslim female bodies. Said, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, <laughs> first of all, what is your key takeaway from Mona's uh, talk? Who wants to start? Um, the revolution is my cunt. <laughs> <laughs> and what that does is, that mean to you? That is so powerful to me because it, it, it is a certain, there's a certain level of, uh, or like that, it's the highest level of uh, unapologeticness that one can have as um, a female bodied person, as a queer person, as a black or brown person. Um, as a person who comes from uh, formerly uh, colonized uh, regions, it, I think it's it's I think it, there's levels to what uh, Mona said. So I hope it's gonna like settle, settle. Yeah. Thank you, Milu. What is your key takeaway? Yeah, I think it's. Thank you, Mona, for sh sharing all those beautiful kind of things, and I, I I think it's really inspirational. So thanks for sharing. Just want to say that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, for me too. Uh, very, very um, uh, inspiring talk. And um, uh, yeah. And also as an anti racist, of course, that's the first thing that I am. I always say, like, uh, I'm first an anti racist before I'm even a feminist, even though I'm a woman. But um, yeah, it was very inspiring. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. So, and when it comes to the freedom of choice and, and sexual liberation, how free do you feel in your body and in your sexuality? To whom is the question? <laughs> to all <Yeah>. of you. <laughs> so, who wants to start? I'm on the spot today. Yeah. <laughs> um, how free do I feel? Yeah. In what sense do you mean? Or do you feel free? If you would ask it to me, I would still say I'm not that free. I'm not as free as Mona. I'm not as free as I yeah. would like to be. I think the freedom, the bodily freedom, is uh, there's a complexity in the Dutch context, uh, especially. That's why I really, really appreciated uh, when Mona uh, said, um, when Mona basically shouted out the activists, the local af activist communities, because I think. Um, the local realities are very important when it comes to resistance. And in the Dutch context, mm, when I think about um, um, this bodily mm, freedom, I think about this first um, encounter I had with sexuality in group context, in Dutch group context. It's like an anecdote. I was a young girl, I was 12, I think, um, and we had to go for uh, gymnastics at school. And it was the first time that I saw like other um, naked uh, um, uh, female body people um, in, a, in a room. Um, um, and most of them were white bodies. And a lot of things happened for me there. Uh, but one of the most interesting things was that everything, everyone was wearing a thong. And um, all of those young girls, right? And it really got me thinking about this idea of like, what does it mean? What does freedom mean in that context? Um, I remember I got home that day and I asked my mother if I could wear, a th if I could buy a thong. And because of, you know, um, African parents, conservatism, um, she for to, to kind of like 
um, uh, as a joke, she bought me like this XL thong that I could <laughs> never wear, that I had to like tie to fit me. Um, but it, it got me thinking about like, you know, what, what does freedom mean? Why did I feel like I needed to, to wear this thong? Um, and also about like these bodily, this, this, this um, the way you you perceive yourself having a black or brown body as opposed to you know the white bodies and growing up, so I think that's like a seed that was planted inside of me where I started thinking about uh, bodily autonomy, um, where I started thinking about these group dynamics and what consists of us um, choosing or not choosing what we do to our bodies. Um, and I think it's still it's still a journey I'm on this uh, mm. this freedom. It's what you write about in in your essay collection, also about uh, the perils of of growing up as a girl. Um, let, let's come back to that later because I also want to hear from Saida and Milu uh, what freedom means to you and do you feel free in your body, Saida? So uh, that's actually a personal question, and. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that coming away way uh, over here because I expected that question also. So I was thinking like, wow, probably they are going to ask me all of my kinky stories that I have in my <laughs> <laughs> in my uh, my uh, back. Was not on my but, list, no. But, but that's not it. So, so yeah, if I think about sexual revelation uh, on on the, in this time age, the song, I would put it like that, then I would say like, I think, I believe that um, the, re the revelation of the sex, uh, so of the women, of the woman, um, in my perspective, that's actually uh, much bro um, broader than just um, the freedom of uh, determination, because be with that comes also the freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. So if you have freedom of determination that says, like, my body, my choice, uh, also uh, comes from who am I fucking with? I use the language as my colleague of my <laughs> Mona. Uh, <laughs> that's my choice. And mm -hmm. if I want to have sex with somebody, it's also my choice. So if I even don't want to have sex with somebody, it's also my choice. And uh, there are people, uh, yesterday I was uh, at a very interesting um, um, meeting also, and there was like uh, a group which was very interesting for me. And it was a group who was um, saying I'm asexual. Mm -hmm. So it's a new develop, uh, developing group. So you have also people who are saying, um, my sex is asexual. I don't even mm -hmm. want to have sex. Yeah. You know? so, <coughs> so we have, as a society, also respect that kind of <coughs> point of view. So that's uh, where um, uh, freedom of choice also comes from. Yeah. And also self-determination. You know, of um, the right. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you it's know, not so, so, so if you say, like, what is your perspective on um, my personal sexual liberation? Well, yeah. Then I have to pack my kinky backpack <laughs> and, <laughs> and open that. But that's a whole different kind of... Uh, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. So I will leave that. Yeah, if it's yeah. interesting, uh, mm -hmm. indeed, there's also... Uh, asexuality, where people don't just are not, they don't feel sexual, yeah. and we we are living in a society where it is assumed that you want to have sex, and and in this hypersexualized mm -hmm. society, you can feel yeah. really strange if you don't. So that is a nice remark, yeah. Milu. What is your uh, yeah, level of freedom? How so free would you be? I, I I grew up with the idea that the sexual uh, sexual revolution was completed, so I always thought, hmm, I I'm free until I, I think I became 20 or 21, and you just um, uh, mentioned it in the introduction, but I, then I got slut-shamed a lot mm -hmm. for a year and a half by a whole group of not really nice people. Uh, and then I started to write and uh, started to read about feminism, and then I 
um, yeah, I find out that I was not as free as I thought I was, and I wasn't aware of the male gaze and of, of m many more things that I, I am now. So, yeah, I'm still working on it. Can you, can you describe what the influence of this slut shaming was on your sexual development? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, a lot. It, it had a lot of... Um, was it hindering your... I f really felt ashamed because so many people were saying for such a long time that I was a slut. And so there was a lot of shame. So I think, yeah, a lot of shame. And did it hinder you in having sex the yeah, way you wanted yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. How did you overcome that? How did you liberate yourself from that shame? Yeah, so for a year and a half, I st started to have co to ha have conversation with those people, but they're always saying that it's a joke. Come on, Milou. Uh, next week it, it will be a, uh, will be a, uh, about another woman or another girl, and they always like my experience. Yeah, bagatelliseren. They yeah, that's an yeah yeah yeah. And then <laughs> that's a hard word Thank in you. English. Uh, and then I made a video. Yeah. And I put that on Facebook and it went viral. And that was, yeah, uh, that was like, um, yeah, my the only thing I could do I, at that moment, I think. So yeah, and that was liberating. That was liberating. Yeah, because then yeah. I knew that I, I was not crazy or what, because so many people were saying that to me. Yeah. But, and then it was like, whoa, uh, more women have those experiences and more people, yeah. Yeah. So that and then uh, and that's five years ago, and it's uh, the yeah major impact on my life and my sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. And on that of others, I might say, because the video went viral and got so many yeah. girls and women talking about it. Yeah, I hope so. so yeah. Mungayen, it's very interesting what you write in in your essay collection. It resembles a bit um, this slut shaming influence mm. because you write. Um, if I may uh, quote you, it all seemed superficial that girl culture, but there were strict sorry, strict rules for becoming a woman and meeting them required top sport discipline. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that and how did it influence you? How did you experience um, it? When I uh, speak about slut shame, I speak about um, um, how growing up, I remember, w so back to the gymnastics class, uh, we would, um, uh, we were young girls like um, discovering our bodies and we were at a simultaneously actually discovering how to, um, uh, um, how to uh, protect ourselves from the shame that of our changing bodies. So one of the things that we did was um, we're trying to figure out is how to make a bra look invisible um, uh, when you wear a white t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And I still haven't found which color that should be. Um, Pink. But anyway, I don't <laughs> wear bras anymore. <laughs> Um, but um, but yeah, so that was uh, that was uh, it, it's actually black in my case, which is interesting because you said pink, which takes me to the next uh, really? point that I was going to yeah, make. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> it's that um, that I I feel as though also when I uh, speak about that uh, that introduction comes from the book uh, from um, um, uh, from Liberté Gaité Beyoncé, and from the gaze that exists um, when we look at uh, black and brown bodies, uh, specifically uh, uh, female-bodied people. Um, and um, um, what I notice is that there's a certain discomfort talking about sexuality, talking about sex, when you know that there's a white gaze um, uh, watching over your um, your body. So um, yeah, my experience has been my personal experience, but also growing up looking at you know uh, other uh, women that looked like me is that um, um, we were. Um, we're developing a sense of self, but also hyper visible of um, uh, what, what, how our body was being looked at. And that was like a, a double edged sword. So it was um, um, on the one hand, um, uh, trying to break away from conservatism, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, at the other side of that uh, of that freedom lay uh, uh, the white gaze that was now over sexualizing the body. When you actually wanted to be able to choose whether you wanted to be read as a sexual being or not, um, so these these were very complex, like. 
um, 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 uh, dynamics to navigate as a, as a young girl. And we still see this happening, you know, on the internet when young girls get on TikTok, when young girls get, you know. Um, this, is, this, is, this is a very fine line to walk, and that's why I'm calling it a top sport discipline. I actually also called that whole a period uh, of my life, uh, the development of femme culture, because I think it's very m important to know that this is not, uh, th this has been made into this uh, cis girl uh, culture ideal, but it's actually femme culture, which is, which is shared by a lot of differently bodied uh, people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's also an important note to make. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, looking at the time, yeah, I still have one question I can ask. And then uh, one question for all of you. So, um, Saida uh, uh, Dolomina um, got criticized, actually, uh, for being white and mainly white m women fighting for white women's problems. Do you think feminism is becoming more inclusive at this moment? Well, <laughs> the funny <laughs> thing is that I myself criticized uh, the Dolominas also. I was once with them in... Um, with there are two uh, Dolominas actually still, and uh, we had like this um, interview together. And my mom, she is also a feminist. She joined um, like in the 70s, uh, back in Morocco, also feminist movement. But after that, she came to Holland, so she went active over here too. And she was with the MVVM, that's like a whole old Moroccan feminist uh, movement. So um, and she came home with lots of. Uh, stories also because they were in contact and stuff like that and she could not rel relate to the whole um, feminism over in that point because she didn't feel welcome she was always questioned and always um, yeah doubtful so uh, also uh, and so she joined the other movement but there was also and Cindy she went but but still I was raised up as a feminist you know so um, the question that you ask is uh, the feminist movement. I don't believe in a movement of feminism right now. <laughs> so I think this whole revolution which Mona is talking about still needs to come forward. Mm -hmm. You know, still need, we need, still need to have the push for a real feminist movement. If, if you see like uh, over here in Holland, uh, the whole abortion uh, discussion, or even inclusion, inclusion of uh, black women and uh, women of color, Muslim women with or without headscarves, you know, and the whole discussion on uh, the rights of self-determination de and the freedom of choice, you know, and uh, you see uh, thousands of people white people, Christians, walk uh, like in 2018, was it probably uh, demonstra demonstrating on the, um, the abortion. I think, I pray all the time, where are the Dolomitas right now, yeah. you know? So, so, uh, so I believe it still needs a push. Yeah. And women like us and also Mona, you know, feminists who believe in the movement. Uh, yeah, I think we need, uh, and also the Atria, of course, very yeah. important uh, role for the Atria on that. And uh, Kautar, which is uh, very uh, also... Um, Kautar, the director yeah, she's, of Atria. She's yeah. really a feminist and pushes also the yeah. ideas. And that's, yeah. we need more discussions, we need more inclusiveness, and we... We need to get rid also of um, of um, how do you say it? Like uh, the old feminism was more like yeah the white feminism stuff and pointing the fingers at women of color or Muslim women, black women, and they were like oh yeah they're so sad. We need to rescue them and stuff like that, and they don't they cannot talk for themselves and mm -hmm. they are oppressed. But you see, the equal women over here are white women. Mm -hmm. And I believe myself, white women really need savior. Mm -hmm. Because... <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm sorry. No, yeah. no don't say sorry. Yeah, be why? Because, uh, yeah, I believe there's a many, many white women locked in their homes right now. And uh, they are, cannot escape 
from, from their homes because they are oppressed financially. A lot of white women don't even have bank accounts. And uh, they, don't, they have jobs, they are in this whole luxury villas and stuff like that with all the materials kind of stuff. But they are so unhappy drinking all the time, white <laughs> wine, <laughs> not, not like all that. white women. <laughs> but yeah, I understand what you say. So, so um, last question to all three of you. Um, when will the sexual revolution be complete? Because we already established that uh, it's far from complete, 50 years after it started, actually. When will it be complete and will it ever be? Mm. I can answer that, if I may. Yeah. yeah. It will be complete like Mona said. Mm. She, she, the whole analyzation that she gave with the whole three triangles yeah. and everything, that's perfect. And when we all, the revolution, it starts with the, in the mind. And not only in, uh, with uh, the women of color, but also with the white women. That's why I mentioned it right now. The revolution, it's fuck the pet, uh, Petrachi, and that's the <laughs> word I cannot even announce. So, so it's all over, the, the, and, uh, and we need to get rid of that. And, the, uh, and what she said, that's the whole thing. Yeah. So when the octopus is dead, yes. When men are free to, do you have anything to add to that? I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, panelists. Dear Mona, could you please join us on the stage again? Because uh, I want the audience to have uh, questions. If they have questions, raise your hand. And I want the people in, uh, at home via live stream, you can put your questions in the chat mm -hmm. and uh, we, will, um, we will try to answer them all. But first here in the audience, I have a chat box that is coming your way. Hi, hi. <laughs> no, I, if I throw, I'm surely gonna hit somebody. So if you can, if you have the chat box, please, uh, Ask a question and then throw the chat box to yes. somebody else <laughs> who has his or her hand in the air. Good evening, everyone. I'm a friend of Mona. So. <laughs> Hello, Mona. I love you. And uh. I'm, a, I'm a feminist also. So um, because I know Mona so well, I want actually to ask you a question that I always wanted, you to, ask, to, always wanted to ask you. When did you know that you're an anarchist? and why <coughs> anarchism is important in, in the li liberation. And uh, uh, yeah, you can also talk about the people who are, who are basically inside the system, fighting, but also outside of the system. Mm. Nice question, thank you so much. Did you hear it? When did you become I, an anarchist? And yes. when did you know you were an anarchist? And why is anarchism important? Absolutely. Um, Alex, I love you too. I'm so <laughs> glad to see you. Um, and thank you for your kind words. Um, very quickly, um, it, it's actually quite simple, because for me, feminism is liberation from patriarchy. And anarchism, specifically as a philosophy, is a dismantling of all forms of hierarchy. And patriarchy, for me, is the ultimate hierarchy, because that octopus creates power structures that locks us into hierarchies, and I'm determined to be free of all the hierarchies. And so, I'm, and in addition to being an anarchist, I'm a feminist too. And that's really important, because so many men of the left are misogynist, sexist shits, and so many, <laughs> and too many feminists who are the foot soldiers of patriarchy are invested in hierarchies. So I'm an anarchist feminist or a feminist anarchist, you know, wh whichever one, because I'm determined to be free of all power structures and hierarchies that uphold power structures. Thank you so much. Behind you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Mona, for your talk. It was really uh, great to hear. Also, fabulous that you brought the international view in the discussion, because I think one thing that Dutch media really does is not talk about these struggles. And so we don't learn about them. And so we're stuck in the Netherlands with uh, Geert Wilders uh, of the Freedom Party, Freedom, uh, quotation marks, <laughs> uh, but also uh, Thierry Baudet, which is a neo-fascist and is really dangerous. And you also mentioned that in your talk. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, I actually identify as a socialist, but I think we can definitely work uh, together <laughs> with anarchists <laughs> on the street. I think it would be really good. Uh, but for the Netherlands as well, I can, what can we learn from your international perspective? And also maybe for the panelists, because you were talking a lot about uh, uh, incidents, personal uh, uh, experiences, which is really important, but we also need to connect it on the streets. And this is hard for us in the Netherlands. I watched the Egyptian revolution uh, on the tip of my chair, really. Mm -hmm. And I took the lessons at heart, but I do think we need to build a movement in the Netherlands, and I'm seeing too much happening about that. So I would really ask for your advice, maybe also the panel, maybe more people who are sitting here. We had a demonstration uh, with regards to uh, the Roe versus Wade, we responded to that. We also had separate, uh, separate actions uh, with regards to the Me Too uh, happenings with The Voice in the Netherlands, which was a program which was uh, uh, also a lot of ha sexual harassment happened. But there's one man who I really would like to get rid of, and that's Derksen, Johan Derksen. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's a rape apologist, and he's basically our Mubarak in the television program, uh, just mentioning raping someone and still sitting there. And we did not get him away, and we only get him away if we build a movement against this guy. So please, <laughs> let's do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, would you like to comment on that? Um, no, I, I think what, everything you said really answers everything you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Point taken. Thanks. So there's a question. There, if you can, can uh, <laughs> maybe, well, so you can also throw it at me and then I will Ooh. try to <laughs> not hit anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello. Is this the right side? Yes. Yeah. Hello and thank you very much also for your, um, all of you. Um, I have a specific question. In the Netherlands, abortion is now allowed. Uh, but if you go to an abortion clinic, there will be Christian fanaticies demonstrating and harassing the women and some men who follow these women. And there are women harassing other women, Christian fanaticies, not specific Christians, but um, uh, religious fanaticies. I, I wanted to ask you to share your thoughts about that. When fem women, religious fanaticies, are fighting other women who are fighting for their rights to decisions about their body and actually changing laws for the whole country, which obviously has uh, influence on these women also. But what to do with these fanatics who are harassing physically women who want to decide about their own bodies? Right. Is this question for me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because um, I, I touched on it, you know, um, briefly during my talk about um, white women and abortion in the United States and, and white women being foot soldiers of the patriarchy who benefit from, from patriarchy. In the United States, you know, every, wh wh whenever we talk about Roe v. Wade, you know, you'll see all these comments on social media, men can't tell me what to do with my uterus, which of course is true. But, but the reality in the United States is that the majority of the anti-abortion movement has been white Christian women. Whether it's terrorists, and I use this word deliberately, I never use the word terrorism, except in this instance, whether it's terrorists who are bombing abortion clinics and murdering abortion providers in the United States, or legislators, lawmakers who have pushed for laws, or attorneys general, or judges, or the Supreme Court justices that we see now in the United States, it's almost... What is happening in the United States, you can apply here in the Netherlands. And the reason that they have got away with it is the reason that they get away with it here in the Netherlands, that white and Christian are considered the default and not dangerous. The dangerous is the black man or the brown man or what happens over there. But as long as it's white and Christian people, and there is a great book that I quote in several of my essays about the anti-abortion movement in the United States in which the author who has studied them in, in, in great detail says, the reason that law enforcement, that the reason that these women got away with this, this harassment you're talking about, is because law enforcement had a hard time recognizing the danger of white Christian women. Because we live in white supremacist societies mm -hmm. that don't see white Christian people as dangerous, it's the rest of us who are dangerous. And this is why I, I said I come with a warning from your future, because abortion for now is legal, but look what is happening in the United States. Because of 50 years of work, mostly by white Christian women, in all levels of power, because this isn't now just, you know, a few women on the street. Well, the Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, you know? So they have achieved. This is a victory of the worst kind. That's why I call it a social regression. So pay attention. These white Christian women are foot soldiers of the patriarchy. And any feminism that does this nonsense about sisterhood and all women support other women, that is rubbish. 
It is not true because there are white Christian women who directly benefit from patriarchy and they're the ones you're talking about and they are the ones who will destroy your abortion rights if you're complacent and you don't pay attention to the octopus. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Yes, another question. Hello, Mona. Thank you so much for your inspirational lecture. Um, I've got a question regarding your theoretical conceptualization of the oppressive machine. Because um, I see the crux of the matter is the economic subordination through the overarching structure of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And capitalism manufactures all these octopus tentacles like white supremacy, racialization, um, the destruction of the environment and ecological systems. Mm -hmm. And you say uh, the crux of the matter is um, patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that my conceptualization is maybe uh, yeah, too much um, indicative of a reduction to uh, this very uh, Eurocentric, economic-centric um, Marxist orthodoxy in which oppression is conceptualized as uh, the implications of mm -hmm. capitalism. Right. Um, thank you for your question. This is this eternal, endless debate. That, this is why I'm an anarchist and you're a Marxist. <laughs> this is the difference because I, I think that, that that's what it, it comes, especially for feminist anarchists such as myself. Um, this discussion calls to mind the first anarchist. So the first group that was recognized as a feminist anarchist group was in Argentina in the late 19th century. And they had a newspaper called Voice of the Woman. Uh, Vos de la Mujer, I think it is. My Spanish is terrible. But um, one of the things that you know, the women would often say is no God, no boss, no husband, as, as a declaration of what the kind of revolution that we need is. Because they recognized and they would directly address the men of the left um, in their anarchist movement by saying, you know, for you, you recognize what capitalism does, you recognize the oppression of the state, but you don't recognize your own oppression against us. And that same ethos was taken into Spain during the Spanish Revolution when you had also anarchist feminist groups who were saying, you know what, we're all fighting Franco, but we're also, we as feminist anarchists are fighting the men. These are men of the left now who recognize the evils of capitalism. And again, I go to Japan, a Japanese feminist anarchist whose name I can't remember because I'm very jet lagged. But I wrote about her in my newsletter, Feminist Giant. I wrote an essay called Inciting Liberation because anarchism is often accused of inciting violence. I say anarchism incites liberation. This Japanese feminist said men have to understand the same zeal that you use in fighting the state and, and, and capitalism capitalist oppression is the same zeal that we women have to use to fight the oppression of men as well as capitalism as well as the state. So what I'm saying to you basically is that it, it, it's not, for me it's not capitalism, for me it's patriarchy and a manifestation of patriarchy is capitalism. Mm -hmm. and, and the main reason I say that is because many men of the left, as I said, are misogynist sexist shits who are very, very happy to talk about capitalism but then you start talking about women, you start talking about trans issues, you start talking about abortion, all of a sudden it's gone because all they're invested in is their own personal power when it comes to the state and capitalism. So we, we, we have to agree to disagree here because the head of the octopus for me is patriarchy mm -hmm. as a feminist anarchist. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, I have a question from the chat uh, box uh, from Munga Yende. So uh, can you give a specific example of the male gaze over a black or brown body uh, versus over a white female body? Hmm. That is an interesting question. I'm wondering what kind of gaze that question has. <laughs> I don't know I think, that. Yes. <laughs> I think that will be I think that will be my answer. Okay. But nice. let me think about it and get back to it. One thing that I do want to say though and it's circling back to um um uh, what uh, the person in the back was saying uh, about um um uh, 
the white male gaze of um, this uh, football commentator. I forgot Derrickson. his name. Johan Derksen. <laughs> and, um, um, and I think you made a comment about um, our stories being uh, very inter personal rather than um, 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 being out there uh, on the barricades. Um, what that made me think about is um, um, uh, micro revolutions and also the thing that uh, Mona also talked about, about revolutions, uh, revolutions at home being the hardest to undertake. Um, I wouldn't underestimate the power of the, uh, the the interpersonal stories that we're sharing here, and I wouldn't underestimate the political weight of it because of the taboo culture that we live in, and um, 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 the urgency, the urgency to um, to break away of that taboo by um, making. Uh, um, the political, personal, and the personal political. So I wouldn't underestimate that. And what I would say is because your question was alluding to this idea of um, us having to build uh, this movement to uh, dismantle uh, this man, but also what ev everything that he stands for. I would say find micro-revolutions to fuel. Find micro-revolutions to fuel because w all of us, I think sitting here, we're, we, we got mad about something that happened inside four walls, and then we stepped out into the world to, um, uh, to dismantle that beast that existed inside other four walls. So I would say where, find, find, find a micro-revolution to fuel inside other four walls, and don't forget also that it takes a micro-revolution inside a home for a person to be able to step outside and have the courage, but also have the power, have the energy to even be out there in the world. So to me, it's like, um, as, as people from marginalized backgrounds or like uh, from from working class uh, uh, backgrounds, it, th there's there's this 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 from from queer backgrounds, this this level of like. We, we go through survival first, right? So when, when people tell us, yeah, but uh, we, we need to build a movement, then y'all are not out here. But we're inside also, we're inside, waging war. So find that place that you can fuel, that you can feed, the place where they are waging war on the inside, so you can add your powers to that, so then after that you can be that ally um, 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 uh, that we step outside with to dismantle the this big beast, but the heart of this beast also exists inside uh, uh, those four walls, inside uh, these homes. And I actually want to thank you, Mona, because um, uh, when I was 23, um, I was going around in circles within the uh, feminist movement, asking some of the feminists I would meet, um, um, how do I invite uh, feminism inside an African home? inside an Afropean home, to be specific. And um, I asked these questions, and um, 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 a lot of people didn't have an answer for me. I was young, hungry, I really wanted to do that. Um, and so what you just illustrated about those homes, uh, about the revolution being the hardest inside the home, that's something that I really was hungry to hear at the time, right? So um, thank you for, for, for for finally saying what I needed to hear back then. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we only have room for one last question. Yeah, one last question. So uh, the honor is yours. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, it was very enlightening to listen to the four of you. Um, but I've got a question, I want to know uh, your view on it, uh, Mona. Um, and that's, someone like Donald Trump, it's very uh, explicit, you know, that he's racist and he says it, he's sexist. But there's also, let's say, companies and people like Mark Rutte who act like they're not sexist and so on. And Shell has uh, LGBTQI plus uh, flags on their uh, <laughs> on their buildings, yeah. and then and then they should be on our side because we're fighting against the same cause. But at the same time, uh, it, it's complex, and that's why I would like to know your view on it. 
Yes. If you're asking my view about what we now call rainbow capitalism, it's <laughs> love. I reject it. <laughs> <coughs> I think this is why I hope my analogy of the octopus is a helpful one to take that out. Because, you know, you have to ask what, what is the ethos of these companies that, you know, one month in the year put a rainbow flag out and then, you know, the, the, the rest of the year, and including that month, you know, destroy the environment, have countless cases perhaps of, you know, sexual harassment at work, um, feed the capitalist machine, feed sexism and misogyny, all of that. So it's not, it's not about a performative thing that they do, you know, once a year because they want to show that, you know, they're doing whatever, whatever they should be doing right now. It's about dismantling patriarchy. And so much of what corporate ethos is, is upholding patriarchy, which is why one of the, the chapters in my book on the seven necessary sins for women and girls, I talk about ambition, especially in a corporate structure. structure. And I say that my ambition is to dismantle an ambition that is about being the CEO or about being a corporate success, because that for me is not success. My ambition is about destroying the patriarchy and my ambition mean, uh, it fights to make ambition mean more than being wealthy or being a success in Shell or whatever other you know, structures of capitalist patriarchy. So I'm, I'm not sure who the first person you mentioned is, but I, I definitely recognize what you mean with rainbow capitalism and I want to destroy it all. I'm an anarchist, so that's my <laughs> job in life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And with, with, yeah, with these wise words, we have come to an end. Can I, I have one thing to do. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I gave you an idea of what, what I was about to do. So look, this is something I do around the world, okay? So I want you all to get your phones ready. And we're going to stand up for those of you who can stand up. Stand up. And at the count of three, we're going to yell, fuck the patriarchy. And, and we're going back. to do it three times, <laughs> and each time is going to get louder and louder, okay? So get ready with your phones, and I'm going to count to three, I'm all right? Ready? <laughs> One, <laughs> two, <laughs> three. Fuck the patriarchy! <laughs> that was good, but you can do better. <laughs> Once again. One, two, three. Fuck the, the patriarchy! patriarchy. <laughs> okay, this last one now is going to indicate to me that you're going to go home and start the revolution, okay? <laughs> one, two, three. Fuck, Fuck the, the patriarchy! patriarchy! That's it! <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.